The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, we are back, everybody. Go ahead and have a seat if you would do that. Let's take our Bibles and we'll open to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 41. We'll begin there. 1 Kings 11, 41. The title of the message is, We Need Wisdom and the Right Heart. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you with a desire that you would move on our hearts by your word. Lord, we come this morning with a thirst we have a hunger, and Lord, we know that you are what we need, and so we ask that your word would be poured into our lives. We pray that you would empower our lives by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we come with that desire this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, last week we were studying uh, King Solomon's life, and uh, he was, of course, David's son through Bathsheba, declaration of grace right there, and uh, of course, at this point, as we're studying, uh, Solomon uh, is nearing the end. In fact, we're going to read that he will uh, pass away here in just a few moments. We've kind of zoomed to the end. But we were studying last week about Solomon's life. Uh, he started out very well. In fact, the Scripture tells us that Solomon loved the Lord, except. In other words, he loved the Lord, but not quite as much as David. And there begins something important. But it does tell us that he started out well. He did love the Lord. Now, there was a very important thing that happened, we looked at last week, that Solomon heard from God in a dream. God appeared to him and said, Solomon, I offer anything. You know, ask what you wish. What is it you desire? And in this dream, Solomon said, I ask for wisdom. I ask for an understanding heart. You see, Solomon knew that he was inadequate, he knew he was insufficient, he knew he needed the wisdom of God in order to fulfill what he had been called to do. So he asked for the wisdom of the Lord. And I love this part because God said that he was pleased with that answer. He was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. And he said, I'm going to give you wisdom and I'm going to give you something you didn't ask for. I, and, and that just sounds like the Lord, doesn't it? I'm going to give you even more. I know you asked for this, I'm going to give you that, and I'm going to give you even more than that. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to have your name be above names of other kings. You will be, your honor will be above all kings in your, you know, in your day. And, uh, and so we know this is what happened. And, and, and that, I love that principle of the Lord, for it reminds me of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask. He does even more than we ask, even more than we ask or even think according to the power that works within us. So this fame, this honor that God gave to Solomon and the greatness of his kingdom, it became famous. I mean famous to the known world and, and people would come from, from other kingdoms and, and other leaders would even come you know, to behold this Solomon and all his glory, and all his wealth, and all his grandeur, and all his wisdom. And uh, Solomon really did delight in knowledge and understanding. And, uh, and so he had a fleet of ships, probably one of the largest fleets of ships in that day. And he would send them to the west, he sent them to the east, and they brought back all kinds of plant samples that he loved to study and lecture about. Uh, they brought back all kinds of different animals. Uh, interestingly, they brought apes. You know, this was interesting. And Solomon was interested in all this. He used to give lectures. And people would come and just listen to his wisdom and his knowledge. It was just really vast. The Queen of Sheba, she came. And in fact, she said, I wasn't even told the half of it. I mean, this is amazing. 
And, uh, and so this fame was really something. And uh, the scripture tells us that he had a throne made of ivory. I mean, can you imagine a throne made of ivory? Oh, yeah, but it was covered with gold. And in fact, there was so much gold in Solomon's day that silver was considered like pretty much common, just useless. You know, the common metal, silver, because there's so much gold. And uh, so he had this throne made of ivory, covered uh, with gold, with these arms, you know, like this. And standing next to the throne on either side were these two great lions. I mean, not real lions, but, you know, the statues of these lions. And then there were six steps that led up to the throne. And on either side of each step were two more lions. So surrounding Solomon were these 12 lions. Can you imagine coming before the, you know, the throne of Solomon to ask him a question? Uh, Solomon, I did. And here's lions, you know, everywhere. And... Uh, you know, you see this fame, this greatness that God gave to Solomon. But one thing that God did not give to Solomon was all of these women that he had. And there we must look at something because it's very, very interesting. You know, Solomon asked for wisdom. God says, you asked for a good thing. I will give you that wisdom. And I think all of us would agree. All of us would say, we want wisdom. We would love to have the wisdom of God. We need the wisdom of God. But one of the things that we understand in studying the life of Solomon, and we're also going to study Rehoboam, his son, and we're going to see something here very important. Yes, wisdom is very, very needed, but we need the right heart as well. We need wisdom and we need the right heart. In fact, let's look at Second or First Kings chapter 11. We begin in verse 41. And one of the things we're going to see in Solomon's life, we're going to see it right away, is how important this is to keep your heart completely devoted. Solomon loved the Lord, except. And there we begin to understand something. Keep your heart completely devoted. It tells us in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 41, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, and whatever he did, and all of his wisdom... They are all written, or are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Thus the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel was 40 years, and he slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David, and his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. So it tells us here that all of the wisdom and all of the Acts of Solomon were written in this book called the Acts of Solomon, apparently. We don't have that book, but nor do I believe we need that book. For what God wanted us to have, we have. And in fact, if you turn to chapter 11, verse 1, we begin to see something here that's really important. Wisdom, yes, but the heart. We need the right heart. Notice how it begins in chapter 11, verse 1. Now Solomon loved many foreign women. Thus it began. He says, he loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Remember what happened? Early on in, in Solomon's reign, he decided to take as a wife the daughter of Pharaoh. And, you know, as I mentioned last week, a politically savvy move. You know, because if you go and marry the king's daughter of the neighboring kingdom, it's pretty unlikely that he's going to attack. So it's kind of a, you know, a pretty clever, savvy move. But where's faith? Where's trusting in God in all of this? And so it began a compromise. Now, here's the thing that we need to understand. I mean, look at this. We need our heart completely devoted to God because once we start compromising, we'll find something very important, that compromise is always costly. Always, all will it cost you dearly. Now, when we look at this, I think we should start with this understanding. However, not all compromise is wrong. Let's begin with that understanding. Compromise can be good when it you know, promotes uh, peace, when it promotes cooperation without sacrificing godly principles without sacrificing truth. Okay, let's say, for example, that you and your family are discussing what you're going to do for vacation. Well, you can compromise. You know, I remember when we had our kids, you know, with us living in our house, and uh, we would decide, okay, well, what are we going to do for vacation this year? And kids love to go camping. Let's go camping, you know. And, of course, we don't like camping as much, you know, and I mean, the kids, they can sleep on the hard ground, but, you know, if we're going camping, 
then I'm going to bring a, you know, air mattress. We're going to have a heater. And, uh, you know, so we're talking about what are we going to do? We're going to go camping. Well, I like to go fishing. So I said, how about this? We can go camping as long as we can also go fishing. Okay, that sounds good. We've compromised. Compromise is good as long as we're not sacrificing principles or truth. Good can always compromise with good. But once good starts to compromise with evil, evil always wins. You can't come halfway between evil and good and call it anything good. It's still evil. Even if it's halfway there, it's still evil. Evil always wins. So we take a look at this, and we look at chapter 11, verse 1. Solomon loved many foreign women. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, there was the Moabite women, the Ammonite women, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. It's like he's collecting them here. As if all these from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, neither shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Here we get this clear warning. The Lord told not just for kings, but really he told them for the nation about associating, understanding, you know, that who you choose as friends, who you associate with, who you get married to, all these things are very, very important. So we need to see, it begins here, this warning for them. Otherwise, Israel's heart will be, you know, drawn away after these gods. Now, it's interesting that it tells us at the end of verse 2, it says that Solomon held fast to these women in love. Oh, he loved these women. And there we see, now the compromise is starting to get a little thicker, you see. And it continues on from there. Notice it says in verse 3, he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. That's more than 1,000. That is just plain ridiculous. <laughs> and it tells us here that his wives turned his heart away and in fact, if you go down to verse 5, Solomon, it tells us, went after Ashtoreth. Are you kidding me? Ashtoreth? The goddess of the Sidonians and Milcom? The detestable idol of the Ammonites? Thus Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord in going after these. You know, this is a very important point. Wouldn't this be... Uh, the, the problem of having so many wives. We know, of course, that husbands influence wives, wives influence husbands. I mean, we, you know, we influence each other. That's the way, that's good. But when there are 700 wives going the wrong direction, that can be a problem. You can just imagine, you know, one of them, you know, can I have an idol? Can I have an altar for my God? You know, you love me, don't you, Solomon? Can't you give me an idol for my God? Okay. And so here comes the next wife. Well, if she gets an altar for her God, then I get an altar for my God. What is it? You love her more than you love me? Okay, honey, you can have one too. Hey, well, wait a minute. If they get one, then I won. Okay, you can all have an altar for your gods. And, you know, see, here's the problem. Compromise begins to take hold. Small compromise. When he took the daughter of, Pharaoh's, uh, daughter of Pharaoh. And then it starts to get out and bigger and bigger. It's kind of like having a wild animal as a pet. Have you ever read, you know, these news stories about these people who, in some point of high intelligence, decide to bring a lion as a cub into their house. And, you know, I mean, the lion, you know, just a cuddly little thing. Have you ever seen a cub, lion? Oh, they're just the cutest thing in the world. You just hold them in your arms and they kind of kiss your neck. <laughs> Cute animals. They're little wonderful. Until they start getting a little bigger. Then they get a little bigger. Then they get to the point where you don't tell that cat to get off the couch. Because that cat pretty much owns the couch. And that's the problem with sin. It starts out kind of small. And pretty soon it's the boss. You know, my daughter was telling me that she had visited this exotic farm, you know, where they got all these exotic animals. And she said, Dad, they have a 2,000-pound bull as a pet. 
I said, you are kidding. She says, no, they got this bowl, and then I actually petted it. And I said, really, what, what, what happened? She says, I'm there, I'm petting the neck of this bull, right? And this bull is giving this kind of this bull purr, you know, you know, just enjoying, you know. She says, Dad, then it occurred to me, I don't dare stop. <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you stop this thing? Because he, he's liking what he's going on. And that's sin right there. That is sin right there. It starts out so small, and then it's the boss. It is the boss. See, you look at Solomon. Thousand women, thousand wives, concubines, etc., Here's the thing. God did not make us to be swimming in sexuality. Can we just be clear about that? God did not make us to be swimming in sexuality. Otherwise, you see, the focus is pleasure, always pleasure, always pleasure. And an interesting thing is that Solomon, once his heart started to get drawn away and he started to build these altars, you know, you know what they were? They were altars of sexuality. Do a little study of these and look at the history of them. These are altars of sexuality. I mean, this is going farther and farther and farther from what God intended. You know, all we got to do is to go back to the beginning. We go to Genesis chapter 2, and we see God's intention from the beginning. It tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cling or join to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Here we have God's best from the beginning. One man shall have one woman, one wife. And they shall be joined together. There's God's intention right there. And so you take a look at Solomon, and you see this isn't what God intended. This is not God's best at all. And so really what we see, we go back to 1 Kings chapter 11, and I want to show you something interesting. For in verse 4, it tells us that it came about that when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after these other gods, and notice this, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Now, you can say what you want about David, and David certainly had sin in his life, but David never one time did he even consider another God. Jehovah was his God, and that's all he needed. And you look at Solomon, you say, oh, his heart is not wholly devoted. He's not loving God like he should be anymore. And here's the thing we see. We look at Solomon's life. We understand this loving God is what keeps us where we need to be. I mean, loving God keeps us right where we need to be. It keeps us at the place of greatest blessing. seems to me there's a very powerful insight here for all of us to apply. We read in, in chapter 3, all the way back in chapter 3, Solomon loved the Lord, but not quite like David. And then we get down towards the end of his life, and oh, these wives are drawing his heart away. He's not wholly devoted. Then you continue down, and then it says, oh, he did what was evil. To me, this is a classic example of the slippery slope. The thing that starts small, David's heart, it, you know, see, it started out, he loved the Lord, but not quite. And then a little later, then he took on all these foreign women. And then his heart started to draw away. And then he wasn't wholly devoted to the Lord. And then he continues, and then he did what was the slippery slope is seen just starting there and just sliding. You know, the classic example of the slippery slope is the old how you boil a frog. I mean, how do you boil a frog? You don't throw a frog into boiling water, he'll never accept that. No animal wants to be put in boiling water. And we tried this once with a crab. You know, we, we, got, we went crabbing, and uh, we thought, oh, you know, let's take it home, and we'll cook it, you know, live at home. So we got our pot, we got our, you know, boiling water and our salt, and we had our crab, and, uh, you know, and put him in the boiling water. The thing is, as soon as the crab realized there was boiling water, he said, no way. And he grabbed the edges of the pot like this. And we started a little wrestling match. You get in there. No, no, get in there. I'm not going in there. You get in there. And so finally, we threw him in and threw the lid on there, you know, and then it kind of broke your heart because you could hear him on the bottom of the pot. Oh. And then we took him out. He's all like, like <laughs> mangled, you know. Oh. Then someone told us later, that's not the way you boil a crab. You put him in upside down. If you put a crab in upside down, then he comes out like this. <laughs> like, 
Ah, uh, that's the way it should be. But see, a classy example is right here. How do you boil a frog? You know, by degrees, by degrees, slowly. Isn't that how the enemy would deceive anyone? The enemy is clever enough to know, oh, you do it by degrees, by degrees. And there we understand the heart of compromise begins, but it, it begins with small things, but it ends badly. You know what the answer of the slippery slope is? The answer to the slippery slope is found in God's Word. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. You know what I love about that verse? That pretty much includes everything. If you love the Lord with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength, then you don't love anything else. It keeps you where you need to be. Loving God is the key. Not allowing our hearts to go down the sliding so farther away, farther away, drawn by this, drawn by that. Being in that place where you are blessed the most is that place where you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the key. Solomon had wisdom. But we need more than wisdom. You've got to have the right heart. A heart must be there. See, because we're, we turn now to 1 Kings chapter 12, and we looked at Rehoboam, or, uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam. And we see a very similar lesson in his life. And so what we see in Rehoboam is this similar point, that the heart is the key to godly wisdom. The heart is absolutely the key. What kind of heart, though? What kind of heart? And so it tells us in chapter 12, verse 1, that Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. So they, you know, they anointed him and the, the call to be king, all done in Shechem. Now it came about, verse 2, that there was a man by the name of Jeroboam, who was a son of Nebat. Now let's stop for a minute to make sure we're not confused. There's two men here we want to look at. One is Rehoboam and one is Jeroboam. Rehoboam, he is the king after Solomon. He's Solomon's son. Well, who's Jeroboam? Jeroboam is an interesting person. He actually worked for Solomon. And Solomon looked at him, saw that he was a valiant warrior and an industrious guy. So he put him over uh, various different tasks and, and responsibilities. And he really was a rising figure in Israel. And, uh, and people saw that. Well, interestingly, a prophet of God came to Jeroboam wearing a brand new cloak. And he came to Jeroboam and he took out the cloak tore it into 12 pieces, and he said, Take ten for yourself, Jeroboam, for God is going to tear the kingdom from Solomon's family. Ten tribes, that is to say. And thus he's predicting, prophesying of the division of Israel. And we know, of course, that Israel was divided between the north and the south. Ten, king, uh, ten tribes in the north. So Jeroboam was the one who received that prophecy. Well, when Solomon heard about it, he tried to kill Jeroboam, so he went down to Egypt and hid there. So this is where we pick up the, the story. Verse 2, it came about then when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard about this, that he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. Then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam then and all of the assembly of Israel, they came and they spoke to Rehoboam this. Now your father made our yoke hard. Therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. It's a fair proposal. Then he said to them, well, depart for three days and then come back. So the people departed. So what he wants is three days to get some counsel, seek some wisdom. So, verse 6, King Rehoboam consulted then with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, what shall I answer these people? Now, let's think about these elders just for a minute. These are the guys who served with Solomon while Solomon was king. And they sat there, and they listened as Solomon gave his lectures and his wisdom as he dispensed it, you know, in all of these different ways. They saw all of the wisdom of Solomon. But they also saw the compromise of his life. And so, therefore, I think they've got a lot to say. They have a lot of wisdom in which to give to this young Rehoboam. 
But what does it say next? It, it says to them in verse 7, they answer. The elders said, hey, if you will be a servant to this people today, if you will serve them, if you'll grant them the petition, if you'll speak good words, if you'll speak kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. But notice in verse 8, but Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him. He didn't like that answer, and so he turned and he consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he went to the young guys, you know, the, the young whippersnappers, the, you know, well, what do you guys think? Like he's going to get a lot of wisdom there. And so here's really an important thing. We want wisdom. Absolutely, we need wisdom. I mean, all of us would say it, man, we want wisdom. But you have to have the right heart. Well, what kind of heart? A teachable heart. We must have. We need a heart that is teachable. We say, well, I want the wisdom of God. Well, then when we hear the wisdom of God, we got to receive the wisdom of God. Otherwise, we won't have wisdom. So in order to be wise, you see, we have to have the right heart. What kind? A teachable heart. For when God gives us wisdom and we don't want to hear it, we're not going to get wisdom. And so this becomes a really important point. Rehoboam didn't listen to godly counsel. In other words, he heard what he wanted to hear. He didn't want to hear that. He wanted to hear, you know, something else. I, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a lot of people who are like this. Only hear what they want to hear. But in so doing, will miss out on godly wisdom. Now, if you hear that statement, and then you say, yeah, I know someone like that, maybe you're missing the point. <laughs> Maybe God is speaking to each one of us. And so, you know, Rehoboam, I, I think this is what happened. Rehoboam saw the prestige that Solomon had, and the power, and the wealth, and, you know, and, and he, and all the wisdom, and, and all the stuff, and the respect, you know, and I think he wanted it for himself. I, he wanted to be like Solomon. And so, you know, he wanted to hear some counsel that would say, you, you gotta be, you gotta be like Solomon. You gotta be strong and even harder. You gotta be even stronger. So he's making this comparison, you know. So he comes back, he goes to the guys and he says, you know, guys, what do you think I should tell them? And they said, you tell them you're gonna be tough. And so he makes this comparison and he, he gathers Jeroboam and the people and he said, you think my father was tough? Well, I'm going to be even tougher. He disciplines you with whips, and I'm going to discipline you with scorpions. Why? My little finger is thicker than Solomon's loins. You know, the loin, you know, the, the leg, right? That's where your biggest muscle of your body is. Your strength resides there in your legs, right? He said, well, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Tell me that. You can almost hear. Can you imagine the elders of Israel listening to this answer? Rehoboam. Rehoboam. You're no King Solomon. I knew King Solomon. I served with King Solomon. Rehoboam, you're no King Solomon. You can just almost hear him saying that. Rehoboam, what are you doing? See, we cannot minimize the importance of having a teachable heart. Man, we need a teachable heart. I want the wisdom of God, but within, when God gives you his wisdom, how do you respond to it? I want it. I want it. I'm teachable. There are so many scriptures that help us see this. We need a teachable heart. You know, it's like, it's like sometimes couples will come in for counseling, you know, and each one is convinced that they're right. You know, I've got the right. You know, so each one is convinced there's right, but they come into counseling to watch the other one get corrected. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is going to be interesting. I'm in the right. Yeah, let's go in because you're going to get it, buster. And this is going to be real interesting to watch. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, we see so many scriptures that help us. Young men, let's start there. Young men, likewise, be subject to your elders. All of you. He says, clothe yourselves with humility, one with another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Or Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. You have a friend that will tell you the truth, then that's a good friend. See, if he's willing to tell you the truth, will you receive it? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, I like this one. Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Now there's a great scripture. Be on your guard that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Man, that's a good one. And so let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. Let's look at these words that the elders said, for they are really wise. He says in verse 7, If you will be a servant to this people. A servant? A king? That's a servant? You know, Rehoboam, you know, he, he inherited the wealth. He inherited the horses. He inherited the chariots. You're asking me to serve these people? Listen, Rehoboam, this is important. If you will be a servant to this people today, if you will serve them, grant them what they're asking, speak good, kind words to them, and they'll be your servants forever. See, here's the thing. We need a heart that serves you. I want wisdom, a heart of teachability, but a heart that's willing to serve, to serve others, to look around and to serve. You know, you look at King David. Did you know that he did that? He had that same heart. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 13, verse 36, for David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, you know, died and went to his fathers. There's that David. David is the one who took those renegade, distressed, indebted, embittered guys and he served them, he taught them, exampled for them, and they became mighty men of God. He served his generation. And so you see it in, in, in David. You see it in Jesus. Jesus also in the New Testament, he came with a very similar statement in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, where he said, Come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said it too. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh man, if only Rehoboam could have heard that. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. For in Matthew chapter 20, and I love quoting these verses because to me, they are so good. I mean, they, you can just look at Matthew 20, starting in verse 25, and man, does it ever apply to our lives. He tells us this. Jesus called his disciples to himself. They were kind of squabbling about, you know, who's the greatest and all that sort of thing. And so he called them to himself. And he said, now you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, which is to say they're bossy. You know how it is out there. He said to his disciples, those who have authority, those who have positions, those who have leadership, you know how they are? They're bossy. They like to boss people around and tell them what to do. And he said, you know that how the great men, they'll exercise authority over them? This is not to be so among you. Whoever wishes to become great, let him be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you, let him be the slave. Jesus said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, I didn't come to be served. I've come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. There is the heart of the Lord as well. See, you look at our own lives, and the, here's the truth. You can't mold and shape children with a heavy yoke. It doesn't mold them and shape them very well at all. You can't mold them and shake, uh, shape them with a heavy attitude or a heavy hand. See, when I look at this word that the elders gave to Rehoboam, trying to show him how important it is to have the right heart towards the people around him, he was really, they were giving some great wisdom here, for to serve is to love. What did Jesus say was the greatest commandment of all? Remember when they came and said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all commandments? Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he said this amazing statement. 
all of the law and all of the prophets, all of it. You can take the entire Old Testament and you can hang them on those two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and you have captured the heart of God right there. And so this is what they were giving them. You want wisdom? Great. But you need the right heart. For the way we interact with one another has everything to do with whether we're wise. To serve is to love. That's what he says. The elders are trying to convince him that it's much more effective than trying to intimidate them. Isn't it the same for us in how we relate to those around us, how we parent our children, how we relate to one another in our marriage, how we relate to those around us in whatever place? Isn't that the way God relates to us? Did God come to us with love or with intimidating power? Well, it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that the kindness of God is what leads you to repentance? It's the kindness of the Lord. Not the harsh intimidation of the Lord. God doesn't come to you, my little finger is thick. God doesn't do that. Come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy laden. For the best thing that we could do is to follow after that example. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. When someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, I'm convinced that they come to faith in Jesus Christ when they know how much they are loved. Because God loved so much. What does it say? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. That's what he said. Love changes people. It's much more effective. You want wisdom? You need the right heart. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word because it is so right. It is just so right. We look at Solomon and all the wisdom that we see his heart by degrees is falling further and further away. Lord, we are called today to love you again, to come back to our first love, to reignite love that we have in our hearts for you. So Lord, we declare that today. We come back to you. Church, I, I, as we're praying, I don't know where you are or what's happening in your life, but I do know this, that God loves you and wants you to know that. And if for some reason you find yourself on a slippery slope, could it be because you've been wandering a little farther, a little farther, a little farther away? You've got to have your own way, your own agenda, your own things. But God is calling you back, saying, you know, the best place you can be, it's right here. The best place you can be is right in love with God. You've been wandering from the Lord. He's calling you back. If you would say to the Lord, I'm coming back. I won't be a wandering soul, Lord, anymore. I'm coming back. I'm yours. Here I am. Would you just say that to the Lord? Just raise your hand and say it to him. Here I am, Lord. I'm coming back. My wandering soul has wandered too much. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. God bless you guys. God bless you, everyone. God bless you too there in the back. God bless you guys. Anyone else? God bless you, man. Father, we are so thankful for that desire, that heart that you give to us, that calling on our lives, the example you've given us. Oh, you want us to have wisdom. You offer wisdom, but Lord, we need the right heart. And so I pray that today, we would indeed truly change our heart. We love you for that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. 
Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, may God bless you.